Hi there, Graham from Penguin Motors here with the latest update and our 1905cc crossflow build. So here we've got the steel crank with a little bit of progress in that in my gallery brushes and drill, we've rotted through all the oil galleries and a scary amount of grit and dirt came out. So after a thorough clean, we've now inserted some oil gallery plugs to blank off the drillings. One notable thing about this crank when I looked at it is the big end oil galleries look to be on rather on the small side to me. They're cross drilled, which is brilliant for a really high RPM engine that tends to centrifuge the oil out. However, this is running at a more normal road speed with a more normal oil pump. So I decided we would do a bit of race prep and radius the edges of the oil gallery just to promote oil flow to and from the crank bearings. The slight relieving of the hole there greatly improves oil flow out or in, as the case may be, because there's a main, the oil's actually going in that hole, not out. Two flywheels here. The first John supplied with the engine, which is Excatrum, lightened on the outside and considerably lightened on the inside. Don't know if you can read that. It says 5.4 kilos. The only thing is, I think it's slightly too light for normal usage in a road car. A lot of people will tell you a lightened flywheel reduces torque. Nothing to salt. The flywheel doesn't actually affect the torque output in any way. What the flywheel does is store energy. A very light flywheel means the engine will rev better, but it also means the engine is much more easy to stall, or you try and feed in a little bit of throttle, just a little bit of clutch slip, just to get up a, a minor hill, and the revs are soaring and the wheels are spinning, or yeah. So really, I've got customers that have fitted overly light flywheels and then driven the cars and they're horrible. So with a flywheel on a road car, I always err on the side of caution and go slightly heavier versus all the race engines I've got in here on skeleton steel flywheels weigh nothing. So to that end, I took a standard flywheel, which initially weighed in at a hefty eight and a half kilos, and I've thinned it down a bit, re reduced a bit off the edge there, a bit on the inside. And what I think is most important is no material has been removed there. Removing material in this area will seriously weaken the flywheel. We've suffered exploding flywheels, they're not good. So this has been lightened, and we've reduced it by, I think about 1.75 kilos. It's now down to 6.6. .6. It's roughly halfway in between the very light flywheel that was out the Caterham, which will cope very well with a light flywheel because a Caterham weighs in that fault compared to an Escort, which weighs nearly twice as much. The flywheel can now be united with the crank and the two can go off and be balanced as an assembly. Cylinder head, just because I can and because it will help exhaust seal in a faced Manifold face. I faced both manifold faces. I faced the inlet as well. Just improves gasket sealing. This head, starting out a Caterham Super Sport head, was already ported as it came from the Caterham. But crossflows need considerable opening out of the inlet ports to get sufficient flow. Downside of opening out a crossflow port to any real extent is the real danger of hitting a pushrod tube. And indeed, we broke through the pushrod tubes, but to be honest, that's nothing to worry about. In order to get a big enough port, you end up breaking through. Ported head to open it out to a more sensible size, broke through all the pushrod tubes, which then meant drilling and reaming the pushrod holes out to take a tube. And then once we drilled it out, take a steel tube, bit of Loctite, insert the pushrod tube and knock it down, let the Loctite go off. Looking down the inlet port, you can see on the left, pushrod tube sleeve. And if you look further down up there, above my finger, we've removed the rest of the valve guide boss. And the next step will be to drill the head to take valve guides. So we've now got the new valves for the head, set of REC valves, about the best you can get. What we need to do next is board the valve guides to take the new guides, fit seats, face the head. And interestingly, the new valves have a different profile to the old ones. The old ones are very much penny on a stick and have a wasted stem, but to be honest, in a cross flow, that's pointless because the port is so downdrafted. So the wasted stem doesn't do anything and the shape of these is somewhat more aerodynamic. Proof will come on the flow bench. So here we're looking down the intake manifold bolted to the head. You'll see a dark area at the bottom. This is where someone's previously used filler or resin to match the manifold to the head. I had to take a tiny bit out the top of the pulse to match them. One, one point to note here is that if you look at the sleeve pushrod tubes on the head, they look like a big obstruction, but because of the way the pulse curve, when you look down the pulse with the intake manifold on, you can't even see the pushrod tubes. Here, we have the top face of the head, and what we've done here, we've machined down the spring platforms two millimeters to give some more fitted length for the valve springs. It's easy to shim the valve springs to reduce the fitted length, but it's a right pain to give more, so 
better, easier now, machine the platforms down a bit, get us some more clearance, and then shim up later on as required. Here we have a valve guide and the uh, head that's been bored. The only trouble is the valve guide is exactly half inch and the reamer to size the holes is also exactly half inch and quite new. So we have what I'd call a slip fit. The two are such a close fit that we can move the guide in a guide bore. That's no good. So what we're gonna do, we are gonna knurl the guides, which apart from creating a fancy pattern on them, raises the surface slightly. So that will give us an interference fit of a couple of thou. So over to my baby lathe and I'll knurl a guide. Guide made bigger, we're gonna put it in using our press. In the old days, we used to hammer the guides in and out with a hammer and a drift. You can still do that, but on this, where the guides are vertical and we've got a press, no problem. Spot a Loctite for security. You don't need a lot. In fact, what usually happens is 99% of it gets scraped off, so you end up with puddles of it on the bottom of the head face. That's easier to clean off, and perhaps better than not enough. Although the knurling alone, we shouldn't need it, but we do anyway. Guiding the hole, We've got a little puck that sits on top that's got a recess that sits in the um, top of the guide and we could just press the guide down. Now that guide that was earlier slip fit where I could just push it up and down with my finger now takes about a ton of pressure to push it in the hole so that ain't moving. Once the guide is near to its position I'm going to use another block just to press it down and make it flat with the upper face of the head which is where I want it and we're just going to press it down until the, the guide is flush with the top of the head. Now you might think that's harsh looking to just press down the top of the guide like that, but the guide is harder than the aluminium. And as you can see, the guide actually cuts little round circles in the aluminium. But to prove we haven't actually distorted the guide, here's a valve, I'm gonna drop it in upside down, see look, it just falls in. So you can see from that, we haven't in any way distorted the valve guide in fitting it. And here we have a quick mock-up with valves fitted and retainers and collets, but no springs. And all we're gonna do here is have a quick check of the approximate fitted length. See, 34 millimetres. That will probably increase slightly when the seats are finely cut, but that's okay. We, we can shim down, but we can't really shim up. So rather like checking the fitted length of the valve spring, we can also check the clearance between the undersided retainer and the stem seal, which in this case is a Pinto one, because I use Pinto guides. The caliper shows we should have enough clearance. In fact, as I said, that will open up a bit more when the seats are cut. But in any case, even if it wasn't enough, We've got steel retainers. We've always got the option to take a bit more off, take a bit off the bottom of the retainer. As you can see from this one, I'll put the valve upside down. The ends of the collets are a long way from the bottom of the retainers. Being a steel retainer, we can easily and safely take a millimetre or two off that if we needed to, but I'm 99.9% .9 certain we won't. If we have to, it's because for some reason our valve train is producing far more lift than we expect. Final stage for the moment was to use an expanding ball to measure the guide size, check it on a mic, and then cross-reference it to a valve stem. In all cases, the clearance is here too tight, so the reamer, we've reamed out the guides, and we've finished up with two thou clearance on the inlet, three to three and a half hour on the exhaust, which is just about good. Next step is to have a set of seats inserted for the exhaust and face the head. Theoretically, I can insert seats here given the uh, Myra seat cutting equipment I use, but in this case, I'd rather farm it out to someone that does it all day, every day. Next time you'll see this head, it'll have, uh, have its new inserts, be faced and ready for a bit of flow testing.